Okay, here with Max Kaiser at uh, In the Belly of the Beast at the Guildhall mm -hmm. in the middle of the city of London. Uh, we've just finished the uh, Sound Money Conference um, right. hosted by Cheviot. Uh, Max, your thoughts yeah. on uh, on the day's proceedings, please. Well, I introduced my stamp, Crash J.P. Morgan by Silver Stamp, mm -hmm. and there was an immediate rush to the stage, and I was stamping hundreds of, of, of notes, you know, 10-pound notes, 20-pound notes. A 20-pound mm. note is the best because mm. it has a perfect little space on one side. It fits perfectly Absolutely. into that. So when people want to get these stamps down, and it's going to disseminate accordingly uh, the, whole, the whole message. Mm -hmm. So you can turn your worthless fiat note into something of mass communication. Indeed, yes. indeed, yes. indeed. Yeah. And it def definitely did work for the 20-pound note, actually. I've got to say, it looked really nice on mine. Yeah, it's hot, man. It's yeah. sexy. <laughs> the babes like it. You know. And that's the important you're thing. You're trying to smooth down some uh, babe. Check it out. You know, and they just melt like butter. That's the big thing about it. Yeah. In terms of the silver action that's been going on recently, man, and there's been a lot been made of this whole CFTC situation. Um, I know a lot of the commentators, people like Ted Butler, have been very, very, they've been sort of pitching their hat on the possibility of Gensler and uh, Bart Chilton coming through and so on. But, you know, it's been proved yet again that perhaps there isn't anything to be to be really found in the in the uh, establishment spaces. I mean, do you have any comment on, on, on the CTFC and... Um, where we've been with all that and, and where we might go up the back end of it? Sure. Well, the reason news, of course, is that CFTC, they raise position limits, basically. So banks like JP Morgan can increase their, their number of naked short sales and mm. short sales in the market. And as a result, prices drop. Now, this is a bullish sign because it shows that they're, they have to react. I mean, you're forcing them to into a reaction. Mm. And the idea of raising position limits has, is, is in itself limited. There's only so many times you can do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, now, position limits are going to go to where? 100%? 110%? And if, if the buying still comes in, as it's going to, the you know barbarians basically are going to overrun mm. uh, the wall, and the CTP, C, CFTC comes crumbling down, as does J.P. Morgan. Mm. Is, is the U.S. government going to defend J.P. Morgan? Sure they can, but that means they're going to have to sacrifice the U.S. dollar. Mm. So either the U.S. dollar goes or J.P. Morgan goes, as long as people keep buying silver. And they are reacting. They're raising position limits. They're increasing margin rate again. Again, they're reacting mm. to what people are doing out there in the, in the marketplace. Mm. And they're doing it in a very low-tech kind of way. They're just buying physical coins. Mm. And this is having a reaction in these huge institutions. Mm. So mm. it's like a guerrilla warfare. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the, 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 we're winning as far as I can tell. Do you think that's fed in some respect because of what people have been talking now that... Um, there seems to have been some backwardation come into silver. That's been the talk recently. Do you think that's, in some respects, related to the CFTC yeah, but when you situation? Have, when you have manipulated markets, you, you're going to see all kinds of uh, distortions mm. and misallocations, mm. and that's what that that's what that's all about. Mm. And their ability to suppress the price using techniques of manipulation uh, are running its course because um, it's limited. You know, you can't you cannot fight. Uh, this mass global army of physical buyers. Mm. Uh, just yeah. Max, thank you for speaking up for Ireland. Oh, okay. Thank Super. you very much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. We'll continue to do so. Speaking of, how is the... Um... I told you the babes love Crash J.P. Morgan by Silver. I can tell you. You know, it's like catnip. They're, they're all over this thing. You guys, get yourself one of these stamps. You heard it here, folks. You heard it here. I, mean, I know you guys were in Dublin recently, there was a yeah. big conference and so on. How did that go? Was yeah. that a lot of positive outcomes from that? Or? It went very well. We, we shot a film uh, about the continuing problems in the Irish economy and uh, people there we met with. We had a, kind of an open uh, house. Mm. People came in mm -hmm. and we had a really good conversation mm. with folks. And they're very, very, well, the funniest thing I would say is that I kept meeting people who told me that, you know, Max, the problem is that people just don't know what's going on, and they don't. And then they would, for 20 minutes, tell me all about fractional reserve banking, mm. fiat currencies, Ron Paul, the history of gold and silver. And I, was, I thought I said that's kind of funny because he just said nobody knows what's going on, but he seems to know a lot about what's going on. But that, but this happened all day everywhere I went. Mm. People would say nobody knows what's going on. Here's what's going on. And then they would tell me what's going on. So the problem is that people. It's not that people don't know what's going on. The problem is that people haven't joined forces yet mm. to stand up and 
strike a blow because, of course, that would be a risk, mm. a political risk. And that people, you know, that's the last recourse mm. uh, in any populist movement. Uh, you know, because once you go past the pale, mm. you strike the, the moment of freedom, there's no turning back. Mm. And uh, now we're seeing this, this issue of corrupt bankers is manifesting. And you see what's happening in places like Tunisia, Algeria, Egypt. Okay, that's all connected mm. to Athens, Dublin, Reykjavik. And it's all spreading. It's the global insurrection against Absolutely. banking occupation. Absolutely. Silver is available all over the world. You can buy it with cash. You can buy it for three bucks. You can buy it a, mm. a, a nominal amount. But all that silver adds up. Mm. And for every ounce you buy off the physical market, a hundred ounces of paper silver get destroyed on the balance sheet mm. of the enemy. Mm. I mean, stick with Ireland for a second. I mean, I know, I know the Greens have left the coalition. Um, in the UK, you're in the UK. No, 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 in, in, in Ireland. In Ireland. Um, but the Greens left the, the coalition. Uh, there's a situation where you've got a you've got a prime minister who is no longer the leader of his party, um, and yet he's still trying to continue and push through these IMF measures. I mean, do you have any? Did you have any sense whilst you were in Ireland? I mean, aside from the, the obviously the groundswell of, of, of public opinion at the, at, the, at the local level, just in terms of anybody you might have met within business or politics, where there might be an un unraveling, where maybe the, uh, the IMF deal is rejected, maybe we get a second Iceland in terms of an, a, an, another country that's trying to sort of find its own solutions outside of the, the usual sorts of um, IMF, World Bank type deals, which are basically, you know, uh, just rape yourself, which seems to be basically their, their solution for everything. Did, this, did it seem like there was actually genuinely a potential for something else happening in Ireland for you? Uh, nobody wants the IMF deal. When I was, you know, they, the questioning the IMF deal is now back on the table. Mm. So that's the first step toward rejecting it. And uh, the, pop, the population doesn't want it. And the, the economy continues to deteriorate all over the world. So, I mean, the reason why people, banks, IMF, World Bank, and they put in these measures is because they paper over the problem and then within a year or two, um, they're bailed out by one thing or another. And um, in this situation, you know, that is not happening. You know, the situation, because the, the, the debt levels in the global economy reached complete saturation two years ago. Mm. You know, in the U.S., which is a good model, you know, the U.S. in the 70s, were, were, the dollar was at risk, and they decided, well, we're, instead of having the, the dollar tied to gold, we're going to tie it to oil. You know, and that, that actually created a huge, you know, uh, boom mm. in the U.S. economy. Okay, there was costs for that in other areas, mm. but you, you could focus on a very narrow... Uh, uh, numbers and say, okay, GDP is is improving. In the 80s, of course, Japan was going to take over the world and the U.S. dollar was at risk. Uh, then, you know, the internet, the Nasdaq bubble really exploded up, upwards and there was this really interesting period in, in, in American business and finance. Uh, but every single time, the, 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 the credit has been increased, not diminished. Mm. So the the crash of 87, long-term capital management crisis, savings and loan crisis, the net debt in the system never really goes down. The tech bubble blew up, and Greenspan, again, instead of weaning the system off the debt, they simply allowed for the mortgage bubble to, to increase, and that became astoundingly mm. huge. Mm. And then that popped. So to create the bubble in something that's going to absorb the housing bust bubble, there's nothing in classical economics to suggest that anything like that exists. That's why at Davos, and the notes that circulated before Davos, they said, well, what we need to do is we need to increase the credit line for banks around the world by $100 trillion. Yes, I was going to go into that. Yes. trillion. Dollars. <laughs> so in other words, they recognize the fact that they've got 60 or $70 trillion that they can't pay. Mm. They've got $600 trillion in derivatives, trading on this debt that they can't pay. Mm. And they themselves say, well, we've got about $100 trillion. We want to add that by $100 trillion. You know, that, that's just the back of the envelope calculation mm. that they feel they can go to Switzerland, get around a table, mm. and say we're going to encumber the global economy mm. with $100 mm. trillion of fresh debt. Mm. Now, that's, there's just an intolerance for that. You mm. cannot, you can, you're at the end of the line. It, it, 
it's it's tr the that is a saturation point. You can't to put it into uh, street parlance. You cannot cram ten pounds of shit into a five pound sack. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. The, the, Otherwise, it the world flows. cannot absorb a hundred trillion <laughs> in debt. Yeah. The environment can't handle it. The environment's already at stressed out levels. Mm. It's cr mm. cracking. Mm. You know, that's a direct result. I mean, this is of course another area that people are have mixed. You know, are seem yes. confused about. Mm. But if if you look at the total effect that industrial revolution has had and the, all the chemicals that have been used and all the mm. environmental problems, it's just a matter of, um, you know, cost-benefit analysis. Your rate of return on nature is collapsing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's in, in unimpeachable. You can't, you can't point to that and, and, and not understand that, sure. that these resources are mm. no longer giving up. I mean, in the oil, obviously, the cheap oil. That's right now. Doesn't mm. mean that there's not more oil in the ground. Mm. But if it costs you $120 a barrel to find it, and you know you're not making any money if oil's at 110, you know, or if it costs you know five barrels of oil to find it, mm. so that you can extract five barrels of oil, you know, there doesn't economics don't, that, that doesn't work out. Mm. It's all going negative. Absolutely. I mean, you've made very strong parallels in the past and spoken about this eco eco crisis as you as you, as you've called it. Right. Um, are you? I mean, I mean, as you as you slightly alluded to just now. I mean, you you, you do know that there are there is there are issues. People are on the on the ecological side of this of this of the eco eco. Um, there's been a lot of um, maybe pushback against some of the things that you've been saying. Um, and but do you feel that there is actually? You know, I mean, one can be sceptical of global warming, but still have concern ecologically, for example. Um, it's a, it, it, so, it, it, is it necessarily a matter of um, if you don't buy the whole carbon tax credit, so on and so on and so on, that, that angle of it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't give a shit about the environment and, you know, all that, we don't care, let's just destroy the world anyway. There, there, there may be some more nuance, perhaps. But I know you've been quite vociferous, I mean, particularly recently, yes. there's been, you've been quite vociferous about people saying they're, they're, they're AGW deniers and so on, and you've been banging very, very, very hard. But don't you think that there is, a, there is some space where people can perhaps be, on the one hand, sceptical of some of, the, some of the things that have been driving these carbon tax credits and so on and so on, but also still caring about the environment and still actually recognising that there is an issue, a genuine, serious issue about, the, about, about ecology, separate from global warming. My, my frustration comes with people who can very clearly see that the economy, the global economy, has hit peak credit mm. or hit debt saturation mm. or hit you know, man-made banking disaster. Mm. Uh, why they then can't understand that, industrially speaking, mm. the same people who are running the same companies yeah. are doing the same thing yeah. to the environment. Mm. And they both are diminishing returns. Mm. They're both, it's essentially the same group of people doing the same thing, and it's, it's a man-made um, financial disaster, and it's a man-made climate disaster, because in these two, especially in the, if you look at the history of oil, it, it's very connected. You know, the credit markets expanded when the petrodollar came into the front, forefront of the 70s, and you had this enormous growth of dollar and dollar reserves because you can only buy oil in dollars as part of the deal that the U.S. made with Saudi Arabia, right? OPEC and the rest. Now, as credit peaked in 2007, you know, also, this is oil peaked in 2007 because even if you can find the oil, you can't get the credit to finance the project. You know, Brazil's got oil, but it's a multi-hundred billion dollar project. And if you can't borrow the money to do it, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if it's there or not there. Mm -hmm. The cost is just not there. Mm -hmm. Now, why did that happen? Because the banks sold forward 200 years or 300 years worth of economic vitality to get that money today. They package in their fees what would be available for 100 years mm -hmm. worth of capital that would be used to finance a viable economy. Similarly, corporations have burnt 100 to 200 years worth of fossil fuel to energize this globalization of transportation and other areas, you know, selling forward. Exactly, borrowing okay. from the when you, And when you burn 200 years worth of fuel, mm. like if you burn 200 years worth of credit, mm. okay, you have, there's an impact. 
and the impact on the credit side, this is where the frustration is. The people who see the impact on the credit side clearly can't see that the same people are doing the same thing on the eco side. For this, it's, it's analogous to me. There's a great analogous. And then, okay, now you mentioned carbon credits or carbon trading. I don't conflate those two because carbon trading would be run by the banks and we can't trust the banks. And there's nothing to do with man-made global warming. Yeah. It, it's a dead on arrival, carbon trading. They already have these massive scandals with carbon credits. People are stealing the credits and selling the credits, just like they would do steal you know, any other fraud on Wall Street. Then you have carbon taxes. Well, who's going to administer the taxes? The government? The government's completely in the pocket of the corporations, so they're not a viable alternative either. So credits and taxes are not... Are not. Uh, I don't. I'm not saying that that is worthwhile to go forward down that path at all. Now, if you're talking solutions about both the e on both sides of the eco eco disaster, on the banking side, let a few people start banks from scratch that are going to be entrepreneurial, that are in the basic business of banking, borrowing lending without being encumbered with corporate interest. It'd be just a basic bank. There should, the governments in Ireland and around the world should let new banks pop up all over the place. Uh, and let them start making loans. They're, then give them clean balance sheets, uh, number one. Uh, second of all, uh, similarly, on, on the energy front, um, let um, alternative energies and, 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 and engines and, and grids and things like this give them the freedom to compete. They do not have the freedom to compete. Just like on the finance side, there's no freedom to compete. Mm. So, uh, again, it's a, there's a huge anal analogy there that the solutions are the same, the problems are the same, and it's all man-made. So and the, and and this is this is uh, what I would propose as a, as a solution for both problems. Mm. I'm all for free competition. I'm all for capitalism. Uh, you know, um, but we have that's not what we have. We have price fixing. We have oligarchs. We have kleptocrats. Mm -hmm. So we don't. We, let's just try capitalism for a change. <laughs> See how that works. That's it. Yes. You know, a lot, there's a lot to say for it. Mm, mm. I mean, this is one of the arguments I've had with particularly with a lot of people on the left. And they talk about you know free market capitalism and so on. I mean, I say, well, you know, it might be a, a good idea to have some free market capitalism actually, because um, I mean, how can you talk about free free market when you know uh, states have the monopoly on legal tender, for example? Um, and so, so in terms of, 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 of the payment of debts and taxes, yeah. there is no there is no uh, free market. Um, and perhaps if there were parallel or complementary uh, currencies allowed to compete with, uh, say, in the, in the case of the UK sterling, perhaps that might be a, a, that might be a, a means by which we could actually make something move a little more, a little bit more interestingly than where we are now, because we seem to be on this runaway train, um, which is all, which is all about, you know, it's not even robbing Peter to pay Paul; it's robbing Peter to pay Peter in some sort of weird, twisted kind of way. Um, yeah, it's financial narcissism. Absolutely. Well, this is it, exactly. I mean, you know, the idea that, you know, that, the, that, that at Davos they can start, in all seriousness, saying we need another $110 trillion, they, they call it credit, but it's quite clearly debt, uh, to, 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 call, to, to, to solve the problem that we've already got just seems to be absolutely absurd. There must be some sort of a break. Well, um, look, I mean, the people on the left who are critical of free market capitalism, mm. let's say, like a Michael Moore, for example, who he wrote it, he made a movie, Capitalism: A Love Story. Yes. Now, if you ask somebody like this, what what's their feeling about competition? Uh, I'm sure that he's very for competition. His mm. his films compete in the global film market, Absolutely. and they do very well. And he makes millions of dollars mm. because he's a good competitor. As mm. a filmmaker, he's very competitive. Yes. That's capitalism. So he's not actually against capitalism, mm. even though he doesn't know that he's not against capitalism. <laughs> Yeah. Right. What, what he's against, yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. you know, he's against um, oligarchies and kleptocrats and um, broken financial system mm. and everything like this. this exactly. is, as as I am. Yeah. But he's not against capital. Mm. You know, cap what is capitalism? Okay. There's there's two choices you can have for an economy. You can organize your economy around two themes: mm. competition or cooperation. Mm. Those are the two basic things. Now, can they coexist? Or are they mutually exclusive? Mm. People who are will tell you that they're mutually exclusive. That's generally what you hear. Mm. And there are folks who are on the left who say, 
We need a cooperative model. And there are folks, uh, and we know what the arguments are there. And then there are folks on the right who say we need a competitive model. We know what the arguments are there. Then there's a country like France, which is a mixed model. What does that mean? That means that, and we saw it brilliantly during the financial crisis. When the credit crunch hit, France basically went down to the basement of the, uh, their economy and they flicked the cooperation switch. Yes. Suddenly, 10,000 guys are out there scrubbing the Louvre mm -hmm. and, you know, Notre Dame. Yeah. And another 5,000 guys are yeah. fixing the tracks. Yeah. And another 5,000 guys were hired to paint the schools. Mm -hmm. So, and, and all the restaurants got a 12% uh, discount, mm -hmm. uh, subsidized by the state. Ready to go? Where you need to ask each No problem. Uh, <laughs> give us just 30 seconds, and we'll be out. Uh, we got to go. Yeah. But uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. And I hope this uh, is enjoyed by your uh, viewers. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe we can do it again sometime. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Thanks so much. Thank you, Max. All right. Nice one. Take care.